Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Dr. Susan Pell is the Deputy Executive Director at the United States Botanic Garden, where she oversees the garden's facilities and programs in science, horticulture, education, safety, and sustainability. As a botanist and educator, Susan has spent her career at public gardens and has traveled the world to collect plants for scientific study. She grew up exploring agricultural fields and natural areas in the Midwest and the South, where she learned to appreciate the diversity and beauty of nature and the importance of plant cultivation. Susan holds a BS degree in biology from St. Andrews University and a PhD in plant biology from Louisiana State University. Welcome, Susan, and with that, I'll hand things over to you. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today for this exciting conversation. We've got two uh, world experts on crop wild relatives, and so we're going to have some lively discussion after some brief presentations this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. And I want to welcome our two panelists today. We have um, Dr. Allison Miller and Dr. Tara Moreau with us. Uh, Dr. Allison Miller is a professor in the Department of Biology at St. Louis University and a member and principal investigator at the Danforth Plant Science Center. She's also a research associate at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Dr. Miller is obsessed with plants and has been chasing down crops and their wild relatives for the better part of 15 years. Her research program focuses on evolutionary processes in contemporary and emerging perennial crops and their wild relatives. Ongoing work in her group includes grapevines, perennials, herbaceous legumes, and various fruit and nut trees. By understanding evolutionary processes and crop, crop species and their ancestors, Dr. Miller hopes to contribute to the conservation of crop genetic resources, crop improvement, and sustainable agriculture. Originally from the Chicago area, Allison became interested in plants through trips to nearby prairie patches and summer vacations in Wisconsin. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Botany from Miami University and a Master of Science degree in Botany from Colorado State University. She earned her PhD in Ecology, Evolution, and Population Biology from Washington University in St. Louis and in a joint program with the Missouri Botanical Garden. Welcome, Allison. I also want to welcome Dr. Tara Moreau, and you're going to hear from Allison and Tara in just a minute, but Dr. Tara Moreau is the Associate Director of Sustainability and Community Programs at the University of British Columbia Botanical Garden, where she oversees educational programs, sustainability initiatives, and community outreach. Tara has been working in, to advance local and global food systems for close to 20 years. She is an active community volunteer and was a longstanding member of the Vancouver Food Policy Council. She holds a PhD in plant science and a Master of Science and agriculture. She's worked internationally as a consultant with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and her publications, presentations, and educational programs relate to climate change, food systems, sustainability education, agriculture, biodiversity, and food policy. In 2020, Tara was recognized with the American Public Gardens Association Professional Citation Award for, this, for significant innovation and achievements in public horticulture, and the March Award for Education in Botanic Gardens. I'm going to invite you all to, to submit questions as we go through our presentations today. I'm going to give a very brief presentation about the U.S. Botanic Garden, what we do um, in relation to crop wild relatives. Uh, and then Allison is going to uh, give a brief presentation followed by Tara. And again, please do submit any questions that you have uh, during these presentations in the chat. And we will address those when we get to the panel discussion after the presentations. So first, what are crop wild relatives? Well, these are wild plants that are genetically related to crop plants. They can be the species uh, from which crops were domesticated, so the wild progenitors of the crops, or they can be other closely related species. Why are crop wild relatives important? Well, their genes may be used to improve crops uh, by increasing a number of advantageous characteristics, such as disease or insect resistance, the tolerance of extreme environmental conditions, nutritional value, and really anything else that we really want to see in a crop we may be able to find the uh, genetic coding for those characteristics in their wild relatives. So what does the U.S. Botanic Garden do in the field of crop wild relative research? Well, we uh, have a kitchen garden here on site, and we do a lot of education around, um, around crop wild relatives and around agriculture. So we had an exhibit a number of years ago called Expose the Secret Life of Roots that actually displayed um, some wild prairie plants and also some, some crops um, in, this, uh, in this wonderful display you can see here that showed uh, their fully excavated root systems and as well as their above, above ground systems that we're more familiar with. And we did a lot of education in this exhibit 
kind of around the differences in, um, in the, the root systems of annual plants that are, you know, our, most of our crops um, that were displayed here were annual plants, showing the differences in their root systems versus the perennial plants. And you'll hear more about perennial plants in their agriculture from Allison in a few minutes here. So in addition to exhibits, we have a lot of other educational programs that we do at the Botanic Garden. Um, they're listed here, but we have online programs like this and certainly do a lot of in-person programs um, during normal times when we're not uh, closed because of the pandemic. Um, and we also uh, develop quite a few educational resources through our collaborative partnerships. So the manual here for greenhouse operation and education spaces um, is just an example of that. But we have many partnerships that we've developed um, around crop wild relatives. And those don't just involve education, but also really get at uh, direct research into uh, these wonderful plants. And so I'm going to talk to you about three current partnerships that we have that all are doing research or um, educational outreach around crop wild relatives. And the first of those is with Botanic Garden Conservation International. And this is a project where we are assessing um, U.S. native plants that are the relatives of temperate fruit trees. So things like pawpaw, um, avocado, plum, et cetera where we're looking at uh, sort of what's the status of these plants in the United States currently? What can we do to better conserve them? How can we get them into collections at Botanic Gardens for ex situ conservation? Another partnership that we have is with um, the uh, Morton Arboretum. This is an oak conservation uh, project. And you may not think of oaks as being a crop, but they are. They're a timber crop. And uh, this project is looking at some uh, rare oaks in the Southwest primarily. That's our part of the research. But really, the larger project is looking at oak conservation globally. And um, this project is including uh, monitoring of populations, uh, connecting phylogenetic research, um, and expanding living collections to ensure the preservation of oak genetic diversity. Oaks are one of those species that cannot be traditionally seed banks. They have to uh, be sort of kept in living seed banks. And that is you have to grow oak trees in order to have acorns to plant future um, trees. You can't freeze or dry the, the acorns for future use. And finally, the last partnership that I'll talk about is something that Allison is going to, to give a more in-depth presentation on in just a minute here. And that is a partnership that we have with NatureServe and involves several other partners as well. Um, and this is looking at um, developing conservation plans and educational activities around the importance of conserving American native crop wild relatives. So those plants that are native to the United States that are the wild relatives of crops. And we're using as the initial kind of pilot study for this project, um, American native grapes. And so Allison is about to give you a presentation here in just a minute um, on those native grapes. I'm going to hand it over to Allison. All right. Thanks, Susan. I'm going to go ahead and share some slides. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here talking about crop wild relatives. Um, as Susan mentioned, we have a number of projects going on in my lab that all of which have something to do with perennial crops, long-lived crops, and their wild relatives. But today, I, I decided to focus on grapevines um, and talk about their wild nature, European shoots, North American roots. We'll talk about what that means in just a minute. So grapevines are the most economically important berry crop in the world, and the species from which most of our table grapes and wine grapes come from is a European species um, shown here in the corner, in the corner, um, Vitus vinifera. Um, that species was domesticated from wild populations that are native to to Europe. But there are over 60 species in the grapevine genus, uh, about 20 in North America. And those species, several of which are shown in this uh, picture from the Ozark Forest here in Missouri, those species are really important for global viticulture today in ways that you might not know about. So I wanted to talk a little bit about European shoots, North American roots. And to do this, we have to think about the shoot system of, um, of a plant as the above ground part of the plant body. And in a crop like grapevine, Breeders and growers are really interested in the fruits, the berries, um, that are used to make, uh, to make wine and used for eating. But there is a separate below ground part of the plant, which is um, not shown uh, here. Unfortunately, there was a, it was blocked out a bit. But those root systems are equally as important. And in grapevines and over 70 major perennial crops, um, these plants are grafted which means that the above ground shoot system of one plant is surgically fused 
to the below ground root system of another individual. So this effectively separates the breeding process in grapevines into two parts, breeding for above ground and breeding for below ground components. So just a quick uh, note of how this works. It's really kind of kind of interesting. Um, we use a tool called an omega tool that takes a, a cutting from a grapevine and cuts it in such a way that it's a mirror image. And you can see uh, shown in green here is the portion of the plant that will be used as the shoot system called the scion. In brown, what will be used is the root system. Um, these again come from different individuals and they're just pieced together like this, tied together with, um, with a um, parafilm and hot wax and eventually they often grow together. So you can see here a real example shown on the far right. So what this means for grapevines and crop wild relatives is grapevines themselves are really quite complicated. The shoot system often consists of this European species, uh, Vitis vinifera, but here in North America, there are many hybrid grapes um, where the, the shoot system is actually a cross between the European species than any number of other North American species. One example I'll be talking about in, in a moment is a North American hybrid grapevine called Chamberson, which is grown here in Missouri. And it actually consists of six different North American species that have been hybridized over the course of many generations with the European uh, Vitis vinifera. So add on to that a root system, which in itself is a separate set of wild grapevine species. There are three major species that are used for rootstocks in uh, viticulture, Vitis cenaria, variety Hellerii, Vitis riparia, and Vitis rupestris. All three of these species are native North American species. And again, the species that are used for the shoot system in hybrid vines are also native North American species. So when we talk about European shoots, North American roots, we're really talking about fusing together in a single vine, the domesticated species vinifera, often hybridized with other North American species with these North American uh, root stocks. Okay, so why does this happen? Why did grafting even get going in grapevines? Grafting is an ancient hortic horticultural technique that's been used since the time of the Romans, but it didn't really take off in grapes until the middle of the 1800s. Um, and what happened is that some folks who were living in North America were really interested in North American grapevines. They took some of them over to Europe as a curiosity, introduced them into the south of France in a prime grape growing region where they were growing uh, this, the European species, Vitis vinifera. And what they didn't know is that they were inadvertently introducing an aphid called phylloxera, which really loves to chomp on and destroy grapevine roots. Now, North American vines, because they co-evolved with this aphid, can withstand the infestation. European vines couldn't. And what happened was that the European um, vineyards, about 60% of them died in the middle of the 1800s as a result of this phylloxera aphid. So I mentioned that that it lives part of its life below ground where it chews on roots. Um, it also has an above ground cycle, part of its life cycle um, where it inhabits uh, leaves. So the solution to this problem was to graft the European grapevines, which make berries that are valued for wine to the North American root systems which have that resistance to uh, the phylloxera aphid. And so there was a great search for North American grapevines um, in the Midwest and in other parts of the US um, in the middle of the 1800s. And that's when um, the, the botanists working here in Missouri and elsewhere stumbled on the rock grape, uh, Vitis rupestris, and the riverbank grape, uh, Vitis riparia, and others, and sent cuttings to Europe where they started to be used as rootstocks. And today, in most places around the world, anywhere where phylloxera has been introduced, where um, Vitis vinifera is being grown, those grapes are grafted to these North American, um, to these North American species. So there are rootstock varieties um, that are derived directly from these North American grapevine species. 
Um, root stocks are named with these funny numbers and letter combinations like 3309C or 101.14 or 1103P, but they are they they are the first generation hybrids of crosses from North American um, these North American vines. And interestingly, there's really just a handful of root stocks that are used very widely across parts of the U.S and all over the world. So there's a lot of interest right now in documenting naturalization in these species and, and maybe expanding the range of rootstock cultivars that are used um, in the US and elsewhere. So just to quickly talk about one of the projects we've been doing in my lab is we're really interested in whether or not grapevine roots change the shoots. So we know that grafting was started to deal with a below ground pest, this aphid, but can we leverage the variation that we see in these great different grapevine rootstocks for the purposes of tweaking or slightly changing the traits of the scion? Um, so the short answer is that grafting and grapevine rootstocks do have subtle effects on the above ground parts of the plants. Now, the way that we know this is we've been working in a series of experiments here in Missouri, in California, South Dakota, New York, and elsewhere. Um, I'll just describe one of the experiments that's based here in Missouri, where we have a single cultivated variety of grapevine. Again, it's this chamberson hybrid that I mentioned earlier. We have chamberson that's growing ungrafted, and then that chamberson vine was cloned and then grafted to different rootstocks. So in this experiment, the shoot systems, the top parts of the vine are all genetically identical, but the bottom parts of the vine are either chamberson on its own roots as a control or one of these other root systems. And this set of four combinations in this particular vineyard is replicated 72 times. The vineyard has 288 vines within it. And so what our team did is we went through this vineyard, through the tops of the, of the vines over the course of three years, and we collected data um, on all sorts of different features. Uh, this is part of our team working in the vineyard a couple, of, a couple of years ago. This is actually what the graft junction looks like in a vine. This, this kind of knobby structure is where the, where the um, rootstock and the scion, the top part of the plant, grew together. So we looked at things like leaf shape, the concentrations of ions in leaves, the metabolites in the leaves, the physiology of the vine, the chemistry of the berries, the chemistry of the wine that comes from the berries, the patterns of gene expression, both in the leaves and in the flowers, um, epigenetic modifications, and even the microbiome. And what we're finding is that there are subtle, subtle uh, signatures of the rootstock in all of these traits that we measure in the scions, in the shoots, which remember are all genetically identical. So I'll just mention one quick study that was done also in part of our, uh, our larger project. This one was in California um, that compared the root systems, the impacts of the root systems on two different um, cultivars. So in this study, we're looking at, let me orient you here, each block of two graphs is um, a trait like bricks, that's a sugar measure, titratable acidity, yield, cluster number. These are just features of the actual scion. The top graph is Cabernet Sauvignon. The bottom is Chardonnay. And all these different colors, this is a rootstock trial, are different root systems to which Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay are grafted. And these data were collected over the course of five years. This is a historical study that was, uh, data were collected by one of our industry partners and analyzed by our postdoc, uh, Zoe Mijakovsky. So these wavy figures here show how the traits of the, uh, of the cultivars vary over time. But the squiggly lines, again, are the rootstocks themselves. So you can see the different rootstocks, uh, vines that are grafted to different rootstocks have slightly different features um, that are expressed and observed in the above ground part of the plant. And what's interesting is that the effect of the root systems are slightly different 
depending on what the shoot system is. So the effect of a root system on Cabernet Sauvignon is slightly different than its effect on Chardonnay. Okay, I'm gonna skip this next slide and just wrap up here by acknowledging the team of people that's been working on our grapevine root system shoot system project. This is a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation as well as the Missouri Grape and Wine Institute. And I guess as a take home message, what I'd love to have people keep in mind is that the role of crop wild relatives um, is very much an active one in grape and wine and in many crops. And the effects and the, the, the way in which those crop wild relatives are being used is quite diverse. In the case of grapevines, they're being used both to develop hybrid um, scions or cultivated variety, also to develop root systems to which the global grape crop is grafted. So I'll end there um, and I'll be happy to take any questions when it's time. Thanks. Thanks so much, Allison, that was great. Uh, we're gonna hold the questions until uh, Tara has given her presentation. So welcome, Tara. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Let me just open my slides get started and hopefully everybody can see that um uh i'm incredibly grateful and honored to be here today thank you to the usbg for inviting me to speak um and i'm going to sort of take a slightly different approach and talk about some of the work that uh actually allison and i and many others have been involved with at looking and exploring crop wild relatives across north america um and uh okay here we go before we get started, um, I want to acknowledge that the UBC Botanical Garden grows on the unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the enduring relationship between Indigenous people and the territories that I have the privilege to work and live on. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the traditional territory that you're on, there's a wonderful tool called native-land.ca. Um, these land acknowledgements are increasingly in Canada being seen um, in, in events and they are part of our national effort to explore truth and reconciliation with Indigenous people in Canada. I have uh, the great pri privilege of working at the UBC Botanical Garden. Um, our garden is over 100 years old in the Faculty of Science at the university, and we work towards the vision that plants are understood, valued, celebrated, and secure in a healthy, biodiverse world. Uh, and so we do our work in a myriad of ways, including education and research, uh, conservation, display, and community outreach. Uh, I've been at the garden for about seven years, but prior to coming to the botanical garden world, I would say I was more in the agricultural science field. And I've always been fascinated by uh, interactions and relationships. And in particular, I was fascinated by the relationships between insect pests and their host plants and spent much of my early years in Nova Scotia studying potatoes and the Colorado potato beetle. Uh, and then came to the west coast of Canada to study the greenhouse whitefly. And in this agricultural science research, I became, I was always interested in how insects responded to monocrop versus diversified cropping systems. And traditionally, I was working in very uh, monocropped agricultural systems, um, which today I feel the pendulum has swung and, and I get to work in one of what I would think of in uh, our region as a hotspot for food plant diversity. Uh, this is a picture, one of my favorite pictures, this is uh, of our food garden at the UBC Botanical Garden. It's a central node in our garden uh, and a place where you can see what's happening here is we have volunteers harvesting food, we have students involved in weighing and measuring and preparing that food, and our food uh, is shared with local food banks and, and communities in need. Um, I wanted to just talk about a few approaches that I've taken towards conservation and in particular crop wild relatives. And I just, I, one of these is I believe strongly in the power of food gardens as places for communities to come together to learn about plants, to learn about food, to learn about agricultural systems, and to also learn about the more complex nuances of our food systems. 
a key element and role that I, I get to be and play at the garden is um, uh, running our sustainability education. Uh, I do a lot of work around engagement for climate action. A key program has been the Sustainable Communities Field School, and this is a program that has been designed to bring uh, businesses and organizations to our botanical garden to learn about local sustainability uh, issues and solutions, as well as engaging with local biodiversity. Uh, in the fall, we launched our, our toolkit, which is designed in, in, around the idea that local gardens around the world can be helping to mobilize sustainability within their communities. Uh, and this program has aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Another key approach that I think has been foundational to my work and, and I think is also key for crop wild relatives is exploring biocultural diversity. Uh, this is a concept where we're, we're talking about combining efforts around biological conservation with cultural diversity conservation. Uh, we have a, a photo there of our two teams from the UBC Botanical Garden and the UBC Farm. We worked with an Indigenous facilitator to do a workshop on truth and reconciliation, which is understanding uh, the history of how Indigenous people in Canada were treated. Uh, and we're also working very closely with Musqueam community and their language and culture department to explore uh, the relationships between Indigenous languages and plant knowledge. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. We've been working very hard to build relationships between uh, the Botanical Garden staff team and, and the staff team from the Musqueam Indian Band. So for crop wild relatives, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about how I got started into crop wild relatives. I know for many people it's, it can be a new topic. Um, I read this book by Gary Nabham. Uh, it was probably about 2015. And, and I was so impressed. It tells the story of a Russian scientist, Vavilov, who was the first scientist to travel around the world to collect the seeds of our food plants. And this book inspired me. I was, I was talking about it to everyone. And at around the same time, uh, I was collaborating with Ari Novi, who was the head of the US Botanic Garden at the time. And we were getting started with the American Public Garden Association, a food and agriculture community. Uh, we established this food community to support public gardens, to uh, embark in food literacy, and for those that have food gardens to help expand their food gardens, and those public gardens that don't have food gardens to explore how they could introduce it. One of the interesting that ha things that happened as a result of that book was that we started talking about how can we in North America bring together botanical gardens around uh, food plant conservation and crop wild relatives. Uh, so we had received a bit of funding to organize a conference and that's actually how I first met Allison. Uh, so we had a few years of leading up to a conference that was held in Des Moines, Iowa in 2019. And we had a core team that was made up of public garden uh, people as well as agricultural scientists coming together to organize a, a conference on celebrating crop diversity. And so while it was a, a, a two and a half day conference, I think our team and, and a few of us on the team really wanted to create a legacy piece that came out of the conference. And so we worked in conjunction and as part of the conference to develop this roadmap, uh, which we ended up calling the Roadmap for the Conservation, Use, and Public Engagement of North America's Crop Wild Relatives in Wild Utilized Plants. And so I all, my expertise is not so much in terms of the genetics of food plants and all of the, the nuances behind how we, how we prioritize and study the, the genomes of those, but my interest is how do we get participation and build capacity around this? Um, so the roadmap was published at the end of 2019, and we laid out five different priority areas that we felt were important for us to be advancing in order to conserve crop wild relatives in North America. And as part of the publication, we were trying to engage and get input um, from people in order to have broader participation. Uh, I wanted to give a brief snapshot on where we're at with the roadmap. Um, with funding from the USBG, a really important paper uh, by Colin Corey was published just past December, looking at uh, specifically crop wild relative populations in uh, the United States. Um, we've borrowed that paper and Colin is actually 
currently working with myself and a, and a great group of students to explore what we can do and how we can better understand populations of crop wild relatives in Canada. And so that work is ongoing um, and, and incredibly important and grateful for that. And, and we're, we're continuing to essentially figure out where are the gaps in our knowledge uh, where do we have to be prioritizing? And one of the things that we're definitely learning is that while botanical gardens and gene banks are very important for ex situ conservation, we also have to realize how important it is to conserve crop wild relatives in their native habitat. And just to, to finish up my part of the talk, I, I just wanted to highlight, this was a map that shows a heat map of where crop wild relatives are in North America with botanical gardens and gene banks. Um, but I really see crop wild relative conservation as our collective effort and our collective work. And uh, here we're, we're, we're at a talk talking about women in science and I want to acknowledge uh, the, the thousands of years of history of indigenous women and their work uh, in stewarding our crop wild relatives and our food plants here in North America. Um, and so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. It's, a, it's wonderful to be here. And I think, Susan, now we'll turn it over to you for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Tara, for the great talk. And uh, now we're in the panel discussion uh, portion of the, of the program today. So we've got a few questions that have come in. Uh, Allison has answered a few of the questions in the chat, and, as, and I have answered one of them. Um, but uh, one that remains is, uh, let's see, um, why do the native plants develop deeper root systems compared to other non-native plants? I think that's for you, Allison, around, around the grapes. For me, I think the difference is not native versus non-native, but perennial versus annual. I think if this question had to do with the initial picture of the different root systems at USBG, so just briefly, plants that live for more years make larger deeper, more persistent root systems than those that live for only a single year. I, I will speak to the grapevines though, um, native North American grapevines, it's super interesting because they live on really different substrate types. Um, so some live on rocks and some live in deeper, uh, deeper soils, but as you know, it's very difficult to study root systems. So we recently did a study in the greenhouse. Um, we had, I was just looking at these data this morning where we, um, did an, a 3D x-ray scan of root systems before we put them in pots and then we let them grow for a while and then we washed them off and did it again so we could try to compare the structure of the root systems of these different species that live in different substrates in nature. And as you might imagine, they're quite different, right? They, they just grow differently because they've evolved to live on different, different substrates. But getting to that lesser known half of the perennial crop equation, the below ground half of plants and, and Visualizing that is really still quite tough, which is why USBG, it was such an incredible exhibit that you guys had uh, with those prairie plants. We funded it with yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I should have said that was a, you know, really a heavily um, kind of large collaboration that we did with the Land Institute, which I know you work with uh, quite a bit, Allison. And uh, they grew those plants for us. Um, it was really a nice collaboration that uh, the work that they're doing uh, and we were able to sort of highlight i should say the work that they're doing on um perennial uh crop development so i want to kind of take a step back here a little bit and get into some basics of crop wild relative and we've talked about this a, a little bit but i'm wondering if you could if you know either of you both of you could expand on sort of what are some of the contributions that crop wild relatives can make to the future success of existing crops to me, this is such a hopeful and exciting area in which to work because there's such an incredible diversity of plants out there. And I think often there's the, the false idea that we know everything there is to know about these species, but really we don't. And often we don't even know where they grow or how they grow or, or, or anything like that. So we're beginning to discover, for example, with grapevines, um, that the natural diversity um, in these native species, only a very small fraction of it has been applied in agriculture and in breeding. And just by putting them in a common garden and you looking at how they grow next to one another, you can really grasp that, that natural variation and begin to think about how it might be used. And I think as we're thinking about how the climate is changing and how we might adapt agricultural systems for changing climates 
there's a lot of attention that's refocused on these wild populations that have evolved to all sorts of different um, climatic regimes, and that th those natural, those those naturally evolved attributes might have a role to play in some of our our agricultural systems. So that that's one way. Peter, I, I, Susan, I want to make one uh, note, which is crop wild relatives are those crops, those species that are closely related to existing crop. But you alluded to the work of the Land Institute, and there's a, there's a number of people who are starting to look outside of our standard suite of major crops right now and look to natural variation and different species for, for maybe new crops altogether. Um, and that's another super exciting line of work um, that we're, we're seeing develop. We may, we may not be restricted to the crops that support society today. There may be others that are still yet to be developed. Absolutely, and, and as you said, the Land Institute is doing, doing great work in that. And I know you are as well, Allison. And actually, one of the comments that we got was um, related to my comment about oak being a timber crop, but it is also, the comment was, it's also obviously a, you know, a source for food for indigenous people, and also for people who are interested in just wild foraging. Um, and so that's certainly an area of you know, developing uh, oaks for you know acorn flower that kind of thing. So there's an example of a, a long-lived perennial that uh, could be a source for future crop. Um, I'm wondering, you know, some of you touched on are in the importance of growing these plants, you know, ex situ. And Tara, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of botanic gardens and um, the role that they play in in being repositories. And, and centers for research for these ex situ um, collections of crop wild relatives. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I just wanted, you know, I think to me, I see the crop wild relatives for future success as, as key for resilience. Um, if we can imagine perhaps like a hundred years in the future, what our climate might look like, we, we, we know from certain modeling that the, the different scenarios that it, it will look differently uh, depending on how our climate does change. But for me, I see crop wild relatives and the traits that they hold as key uh, backup for, for future agricultural systems and for breeding. Uh, and in terms of botanical gardens working and, and their are work, of, I, I see botanical gardens and gene banks working very closely together. Oak is a great, great example of a, of a collection of a species that that cannot be necessarily stored in a gene bank. And so living collections, botanical gardens and their living collections are essential. And, and we want our plants to be living and adapting uh, as, as, we, as, we, as, our, as our climate changes. Uh, and so I think that's what's increasingly important. And that's some of the work that Allison, myself and others have been doing is really how do we support botanical gardens uh, to work alongside organizations that do in situ conservation. And, and there's actually many people involved in stewarding crop wild relatives, which is when you when we think about how vast North America is. And so how do we um, bring those networks of people working and, and essentially making times different silos together? Uh, and I just, I saw that quickly there was a question there about our crop wild relatives going extinct faster than other plant species. And I think that's a fascinating and a really great question. I don't know if I know the answer to it, but I know um, Kew Gardens and their recent uh, State of the World's Plants and Fungi uh, highlight that two in five plants are facing extinction. Uh, and when I think of crop wild relatives in North America, um, I'm thinking of one of a paper written by the head of Canada's National Gene Bank and talking about weedy species of crop wild relatives and that many times weedy species of crop wild relatives are overlooked as being sort of weedy and not very important species. And so I think they, they face threats. Um, of course, I, I'm not sure if they're, they face more threats than other, other species though, Allison, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I'm I'm not sure. Just thinking of the the crop wild relatives that we work with, there there are some that are um, that are less common than others, but I don't I don't know if they are under a particular threat more than any other any other species. It's not. It wouldn't be from over harvesting because a lot of the crop wild relatives are not harvested 
some are, but many are not for their product. It's more their their capacity to contribute to programs. So my sense is no, although there are recent reviews of um, conservation priorities for crop wild relatives in North America that would offer more, more details on this. We've got another question from the chat who's actually an earlier one. This one's for you, Allison. It says, in North American uh, native plant agroforestry systems, which species of native uh, grapes show the most promise for um, food production? And they're talking about not rootstock, but fruit and shoot production. Yeah, there are there are native grapes being grown um, for fruit production that are um, full wild species, and then of course those that are hybrids. Um, off the top of my head, a uh, uh, Nebraska is a species that people I know are are growing. Um, Susan, you might have some others to throw in here as well. I think I think there's quite a bit of experimentation that's happening now, um, which is really exciting to see as people um, look to nature for the future of our of our food. So yeah, I don't know if you have any other species. Yeah, that. I would just say you know wild grapes are really popular with foragers for all kinds of different uses, and so I've seen kind of an expansion in the foraging community of you know creatively using um, both the the whole fruit and also just the skins for various things, like getting the pectin from them, and whatnot. So yeah, I think there's quite a few that are definitely popular with foragers, and it remains to be seen will those become you know will those become crops for their for their fruits or not. Um, so another uh, question here that Allison gave a bit of an answer to, and that is, um, you know, are there any, um, let's see, have that question. Um, are there programs available to farmers in the U.S. to grow out crop wild relatives for research, distribution, et cetera? Um, and uh, Allison uh, answered that question in the chat, but I, but I would sort of say too, there, you know, there are programs at USDA that I think have some um, funding available for crop wild relatives, but I don't know, um, Tara or Allison, if you know of any specific, or even Emily, if you know of any other these sort of programs for um, to get funding for farmers for this. I don't know of any uh, in particular. I guess where I've heard discussions of it happening is in hedgerows and sort of as as sort of buffer zones for beneficial insects. Um, so I think I've heard sort of discussions about it, but I think that's a great um, question. And I also actually think it's a, a really important area of future research, because we know that agricultural lands uh, will benefit greatly from increased biodiversity. And as well, we know that uh, we, we'll, potentially need more land to in, to be growing out crop wild relatives. So if people are wanting to do that research. I think that would be or, or that would be excellent. Great, thanks. And while we're talking kind of about funding, I'm interested to hear from you both. You have you know very different backgrounds and uh, but you both are affiliated with Botanic Gardens. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, how do you fund your research on crop wild relatives? Yeah, it's been definitely a challenge over the years. Um, I, I know we, our work has been funded by the National Geographic Society um, in a couple of different projects, which has been really helpful to fund exploration and collection. Um, I know the, the USDA has a program to fund collection of um, plants that they might include in their germplasm collection, which would be part of uh, crop wild relatives work. and then. The National Science Foundation has funded some of our work in, in grapevine, but it was more to address a fundamental question in, in plant biology, which is how does the root system affect the traits of the shoot system? And in that project, um, grafted grapevines were an ideal system and experimental system in which to address how roots affect shoot. Um, so it, it happens that this deals with a, with crop wild relatives, but in that case, it wasn't the explicit focus. So short answer, Susan, I, I think we just try every possible avenue and hope something something sticks. Fair. How about you, Tara? Um, and it's interesting. Most of you know, I would say a lot of the work we did, for example, on the roadmap, came from a small NEFA funded project to just bring together researchers. And I would say we really took that funding as far as we could go with it. Um, it's not very easy. I know we, we had tried to get a significant uh, grant opportunity last spring. I think the challenges is that not necessarily many people and foundations and, and organizations 
even know about crop wild relatives and their importance. Um, I know more recently we've been exploring how can we work and support botanical gardens as individual institutions to raise funding uh, through their own sort of donor or their local initiatives. Um, but it, it's definitely tricky. I, that's why I think the building the awareness and the building the capacity and, and having people understand that there's such an important uh, part of our, our food system is will will hopefully change that. Um, so the tricky the, the funding element is dif uh, is difficult. Thank you. We had a great question come in on the chat. Is there uh, work being done in the U.S. in collaboration with indigenous nations and communities identifying indigenous wild food crops, their conservation and potential future wider use? In the U.S., I'm not as familiar, but I know in the in the funding that we have been trying to put together, Alice and myself and part of our team on the roadmap, we had there was a number of amazing groups doing work, some nationally, some regionally. Um, and it's the same in Canada. There's some national initiatives, regional initiatives. And so it's, I think, um, trying to uh, identify those groups and, and build relationship, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, and to support that work that's already underway is, is what I would say is, is a key next step. Yeah, I would agree. I, I know of a few projects around um, around the country focused in different regions and different crops, um, but they, I don't know of a single kind of overarching vision that that links all of those type that type of work together. And that, that actually speaks to a larger point. I think about crop wild relatives. That here, I think I heard you say earlier there there are a number of different groups of people who, for different reasons, have some type of exciting work happening in crop wild relatives. And I think Brian was uh, mentioning this in the chat, University of Virginia, even even um, collections of living plants on campuses and um, really local stuff um, that's really important. So I kind of look across the landscape and I see these individual projects happening on a local level, but I don't yet see them linked together nationally or internationally from say a genus perspective or a crop perspective, even just thinking about grapevines. There's a, there's a lot of great work happening in grapevines, but there's no central, um, that I know of, central in driving that. Um, and I think how powerful it might be if we could link up all of the people, and there's some folks, this is happening a bit in the chat here, um, who are thinking about that for around, around individual crops or um, maybe suites of crops, vines or, or whatever. I think there's a lot of room for building on what is already a pretty strong but somewhat disconnected uh, series of activities. I think that's a great point, Alan. A couple of the ones that I'm familiar with, the National Park Service uh, has several different locations that are working with indigenous communities in their region um, uh, on this. And also, I know the, um, the uh, Desert Botanic Botanical Garden um, is also has a really wonderful program where they have some uh, dedicated staff members who, who work with local communities there on uh, both um, finding, identifying, cataloging, and also conserving uh, wild uh, crop wild relatives that are important to the indigenous communities there in the Southwest. Just quickly on that is when we were looking at the roadmap, and I saw a question come in about working with Mexico. When we when we try to identify the roadmap, we included Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And um, I think one of the things that we were thinking about was how to connect the network of networks. So as Allison was saying, all of these local initiatives, how do we connect them both nationally, but we also, you know, to, to include Mexico uh, and, 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 and Canada. So it's, it, it's, it's complicated, especially to work across different uh, national borders. Uh, but I think that it would be, you know, sort of very powerful in order to to bring those voices together uh, and to see all the players working on this topic, maybe they also call it different things, and that's definitely something that I've learned that other people, you know, seed saver organizations, other other organizations are involved in this work, but they use different different language. Definitely, another good question in the chat here um, it says: Food is big business. Is there interest in the commercial industry in this work? I will say uh, anecdotally, 
Um, they, well, I used to work in New York City and did some seed collecting in, in New Jersey. And there was some interest from the cranberry industry uh, and uh, the crop, you know, the wild relatives of, of cranberry, wild cranberry, which grows in that sort of pine barrens area in New Jersey. Yeah, I, I think speaking for, on the grape side of things, there is interest um, in some of the grape industry in developing um, grapevines for future climates, for different areas, for particular soils. I think there's a recognition that this is based on naturally occurring variation, and and there there are commercial vineyards where um, some experimentation is happening, which is really exciting to see. We've we've partnered with some of these um, some commercial vineyards to try to uh, quantify quantify some of the phenotypic changes and phenotypic differences that are within the those experiments. So I think there is interest. I don't know from a funding perspective. I, I think there actually are some funding opportunities within that as well, but probably on a crop by crop, species by species, region by region basis. Thanks, Al. Interesting question in the uh, in the comments here. Vegetable grafting is becoming very important in vegetable production worldwide. Much research has been done on insect nematode and disease resistant rootstocks for vegetables, but also uh, there can be important impacts on the scion by rootstock scion and vice versa. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things we're trying to learn about in our work now and how yeah how the root system the shoot how the shoot affects the root. Um, we do see that, and it's it's quite fascinating um, to grasp that one of the one of the things we've been learning of late is that the impacts of say the root on a grafted shoot is dynamic. So we'll see different levels of impact at different times of the year and in different places. If you if you've got things replicated across sites um, and across years too, so it's it is, and I, I'm sure. Judy, you put this in here, probably is seeing this too. It is quite a dynamic interaction. Um, and there's also, unfortunately, you know, sometimes it's not a great one and ends up in, in, in the vine or the vegetable, whatever it is, a graft failure, which is, we know from firsthand experience, quite common, unfortunately. So. And Tara, I had a question for you. I just wanted you to maybe expand a little bit on um, the sort of climate change resiliency and the role of crop wild relatives in our um, food security. Um, yeah, I guess I always think of climate change sort of two big buckets of solutions. You have mitigation and adaptation. Um, I, I know globally we focus more on mitigation, and and uh, but for me the resiliency and, and I, I would call our crop wild relatives as our as our deep adaptation uh, work as, as that the, the the their traits, their genes, all of their their elements and their interactions with soils. Uh, we, we as Allison said, we know so little about about these plants um, and I think there's so much to explore. Uh, and so it's it's just wanting to ensure that they're conserved and available for future generations. Um, so I think I think as much as we can conserve them in situ uh, it will will be important for future generations to use them for breeding uh, and for using them for agriculture. Yeah, and I, I would only add that I think botanical gardens have a, a huge role to play in this process. Botanical gardens are, you know, repositories of information about plant distributions, about plant uses, about how distributions are changing over time. And I think collectively, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there's more than 3,000 botanical gardens in the world, right? It's a huge network of organizations. And, and so I see more and more, and that's part of the, the things that Tara and and I and others have been working on. Um, I see more and more this this role for botanical gardens in the conservation of crop wild relatives, which is really the foundation of our of our current and future food. And we certainly agree with that here at the U.S. Botanic Garden. <clears throat> All right, so we're unfortunately at the end of our time here. I've got one final question. So sort of in the style of uh, NPR's "Wait, wait, don't tell me." Um, I'm going to ask you both the same question, and that is, what will be the next big thing in crop wild relatives research? Sarah, you want to go first? Al, either way. Um, well, I'll tell my my next big thing that I'm interested in is taking sort of a more targeted approach around 
berry conservation. So here in Pacific Northwest, we have significant berry populations and they're incredibly important to indigenous people. And so we're trying to sort of, rather than just look at them as a whole, take a, a berries and say, how can we conserve berries? Awesome. All right. Well, for, for me, um, I think our crop, our concept of a crop wild relative is going to expand dramatically as we start thinking about different kinds of agricultural systems, moving maybe away from an annual monoculture system, more towards a perennial polyculture, a system in which there are long-lived species growing in mixtures. And because there were relatively few perennial species, herbaceous species that were domesticated by early farmers, um, I suspect we'll see an increasing role and focus on those perennial herbaceous, maybe wild species that are, are good candidates for future domestication. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. Really enjoyed this conversation with you and your presentations.